first of all, uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for, for being here, especially for the GYA office for organizing it so well. That's with Beate Wagner and Jennifer Plauer. Um, and also for everybody for, for agreeing to be here today. There are also a lot of uh, members of the executive committee here uh, from the GYA. I saw Robert uh, Lepenis already, my, my colleague, um, co uh, like um, co chair uh, Anindita Badra as well. Uh, and I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. But yeah, it's great to see such a, such a good turnout. So uh, Antje Boetius uh, wrote very uh, nicely. Well, it's not nice what she talked about, but she uh, stated it <laughs> very nicely, uh, how we get into a very difficult situation uh, with the climate change. And I'll give you just a very brief overview on like a possible technological solution towards it. And um, you see it here on these slides. I mean, one thing that is very important is uh, sort of our energy intake. And you see it here on this graph, it's a little busy, but um, essentially as uh, like a world population at the moment, we need like, let's say X terawatt uh, hours per year, meaning a, a certain amount of energy. And in the next uh, 40 years or so, we are increasing. I mean, the trajectory is only picking up as uh, Antibiotius was saying already, uh, we are, increasing in our demand, even if there is a dint by something like the virus, it picks up usually afterwards. People, when you create more uh, energy, usually they find also ways to waste it, you know. And uh, one interesting aspect is, of course, that a lot of the energy sources we're using the, uh, on the bubbles here, uh, they are limited. I mean, coal, uranium, oil, natural gases, and so on. And plus, they are producing a lot of harmful CO2. Um, at the same time, however, the, the real question is why aren't we using this huge bubble here, which is the sun, right? I mean, it has more than enough to cover everything. One hour of sunlight would be enough to uh, sort of like provide energy for an entire year. Okay, so then the question is why aren't we reaching out for it? And uh, it's really sort of something that people have dreamt uh, on for a long time already. And you see it here, it's a very ancient dream. You know, how can we make the sun available to us? Uh, even the old Egyptians have thought of this as well. I mean, this is more battery research, but let's say the, the spirit on how to harness the energy of the sun has been an old one for humankind. And the real question is, how do we get to a disruptive technological change here? Because at the moment we are locked into oil, oil industry, our cars are run by it. It's very difficult to think of anything else. And there's an interesting picture here. This is, uh, I think somewhere in New York, in 1900, and you see all of them used horse carriages. There are horses everywhere, apart from one pioneer, so to speak, who's uh, using a car, a horseless carriage. So he, he was kind of the freak in this picture. But then only 13 years later, it's the exact opposite. You know, there's one person here, it's a bit difficult to see using the horse. All of a sudden, everything has flipped around because of all the advantages of using a motor instead of a horse, right? So within 13 years of disruption was possible. And, and I believe also looking at the most recent climate data that we need to think more along this line. You know, how can we change something on a fast time scale? And this picture is here to show you that, they are, that this has happened for certain technologies in the past as well. And how can we facilitate a similar process um, for energy as well? And uh, then the question in a way is, can we manage to get from this energy production from like uh, fossil fuels towards uh, this situation here where we have uh, renewable energy. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm doing solar cells, so obviously I'm thinking a lot of that, but there are other possibilities as well, tidal energy and so on. But nevertheless, how can we do it disruptively and quickly? Um, and you can see it here, that's sort of like uh, the main um, technology used for solar energy, it's silicon. Okay, the same stuff you use in your computer chips. And silicon has been optimized very well in the last 40 years. Okay, so we're already reaching the physical maximum of what silicon provide in terms of energy. And at the moment, we are approaching the upper limit, uh, you know, and how can we improve something as established as silicon? And here again, what kind of out of the box alternatives do we have? And something came up very recently, so called perovskite solar cells. Gerald Hauke would have known them because it's a geological material originally. And uh, one adaptation of it has uh, come up like a sensation in the last 10 years and went from zero to almost zero in, in a very short time. This has never happened for any solar cell material in the past. And it's also indicative of 
how quick science has become in terms of developing new materials. And I'm not going to bother you too much with the details of this material, but it's a very interesting group. You see it here. That's something we took at Oxford at the time. It's um, a liquid which uh, is deposited as a thin film, uh, only hundreds of nanometers uh, thick. And this film here is already sufficient to be a solar cell. So it, it's produced very quickly and not as laboriously as you would do with silicon. And that's the kind of stuff we're dreaming of. You know, how can we use these kinds of innovative materials to really trigger a solar revolution? And uh, you see it here, these new materials are useful. They are so light, they can be suspended, for example, on a soap bubble uh, or printed like a newspaper. So a completely different concept in a way. And this opens many possibilities. One of them being that this new material can also be used with established silicon as well in order to trigger this disruption that I've talked about earlier. The theoretical maximum of silicon is at 33, but putting a new material on the top could really like uh, get us to a new sphere. You know, like a small change, putting a thin coating of this new material could help us to make uh, solar energy very profitable. And that leads me towards sort of the end of this little input. Um, one aspect is how can we facilitate data sharing across diverse scientific communities in the future in order to develop these new materials. Perovskites are one of the most popular examples at the moment, but there are more, of course. Then how can we flip the script? How can we really have like a disruptive um, future? And here we need to um, make um, renewables profitable. Okay. And one aspect of it is to include the externalities. I mean, of course, uh, the climate uh, Climatologists know about this, but CO2 dumping it into the atmosphere costs us nothing at the moment. And that's part of the issue where renewable energy isn't as profitable as it could be. Um, we need new uh, strategies as well. You know, here it's a decentralized uh, energy production in the future as well. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and um, we also need new financial models to incentivize nations as well. That brings me to sort of the questions we could uh, like discuss uh, a little later, how do we facilitate uh, a, a renewable energy revolution in the future? How do we establish more interdisciplinary thinking? Because I'm, I'm a physicist by training, thinking of semiconductors and how to turn them into solar cells. But obviously I feel I could also say something to Antje Boetius as well, because uh, she's uh, thinking from it from a different angle. And um, my background isn't in uh, economy, but that seems to be also very important at the same time as well. Develop, develop that, uh, de development aid also seems to, to go into it. Sociology, how do we increase the acceptance? So I think it's very important to, to bring all these loose uh, threads together. And I thought the uh, earlier input was very nice because at the same time, it puts uh, scientists into this awkward position to almost be morally obliged to become activists in a way. And you know, how do we deal with that? Is it okay? Maybe we need philosophers to help us here as well, what can and, and cannot be done. And then the last point, how do we increase uh, the, the trust within the public is also very important. Uh, believe it or not, but some people are also very skeptical of solar cells. You know, I mean, we could say, okay, you shouldn't care about these people, and <laughs> maybe you shouldn't, who knows? But in reality, you need to understand the fears here. You know, and you see it, I think, very clearly with this vaccination at the moment as well. You cannot simply, uh, threat, uh, um, threat on the fears of people. You know, you need to understand why people are so reluctant because otherwise it undermines the efficacy of your measure as well, be it vaccination or renewable energy. If people do not buy into it, even if, if their arguments from your point of view are not correct, uh, it will undermine the entire operation. And I think that's something we need to keep much more in mind in the future as well. And of course, and with that, I want to end here as well, uh, one central role goes towards uh, the young scientists as well. You know, they have a much uh, larger stake in the future to an extent, just age-related, let's say. <laughs> but even uh, moving away from that, uh, of course, uh, it's also on them to change the curricula needed in the future as well. The way I studied physics didn't include many of these topics, but maybe it should in the future. And here, I think the, the young scientists and the young academies can play a crucial role as well in order uh, to bring this knowledge into the next generation um, as well. Um, activities like Fridays for Future are indica indicative of that as well. I think here, um, young scientists and the young academies in general can, uh, can be very crucial in the future. And with that, a very crisp uh, overview, I'd like to give back to the chairperson, to Leila. Thank you.